B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018. And just a little note as I begin the podcast, uh, my internet service has uh, suddenly evaporated here, so there may be a delay in posting today's podcast, and I apologize. Well, Donald Trump has little self-control, and his advisors have told him that the last thing he should do is attack Christine Blasey Ford. But he can't help himself, and when he gets in those mob rally situations... He really feeds off the adulation that comes from his idiot followers. And so, at one of those rallies in Mississippi last night, Trump unloaded, and he mocked Christine Blasey Ford's testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And it produced the predictable reactions from Democrats and Republicans alike. But despite the president's bad behavior, the kind of slut-shaming that he is attempting here, and it's now part of the Republican playbook, as I will detail for you in a moment, Trump's mockery of Blasey Ford undermines his false position, which is, oh, you know, we, we certainly sympathize with her. Something bad happened to her. But, of course, it didn't happen uh, with Brett Kavanaugh. He never did anything like that because he's a saint. He's, a, he's an altar boy. And it works for the fools who are fooled by Trump on a regular basis. But this really shows in a bare-knuckled way the true attitude of the guy in the Oval Office, and the virus that I have described, the Trump virus, that is part misogyny and part compulsive liar. And that's what's infected the Republican Party, and we see it on full display in this episode here. So pivotal senators like Lisa Murkowski of Alaska... She said, I'm taking everything into account. The president's comments yesterday mocking Dr. Ford were wholly inappropriate and, in my view, unacceptable. Jeff Flake, Republican of Arizona, there is no time, no place for remarks like that, but to discuss something this sensitive at a political rally is just not right. I wish he hadn't done it, and I just say it's kind of appalling. Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, called it just plain wrong. But despite these actions, will those key senators vote against Brett Kavanaugh? Are they sufficiently appalled? Or is this just more posturing, more public commentary designed to ease the public into accepting that they're going to confirm this son of a bitch? And they do not care what testimony is brought forward. So the attack on the victims is now shaping up as a central element here. The chair of the Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, is citing the statement of a former boyfriend of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. And they're picking at something that is really not consequential in my view. But you may recall that Rachel Mitchell, the hired prosecutor brought in to ask questions for the old white men of the Republican caucus in the Judiciary Committee who didn't want to be grilling Dr. Ford themselves. Well, she asked an odd question, which was about the polygraph exam that Blasey Ford took in August. And the question she asked was whether she had ever advised anyone else about taking a polygraph test, and uh, Blasey Ford said no. Well, we have to go back to the 1990s when Blasey, before she married Ford, was studying at uh, Pepperdine in Southern California, and she dated a man for a period of time who has come forward. And he says... Now, his name has been redacted, but we believe we know who he is. His name is uh, believed to be Brian Merrick, because he showed up in a profile of Blasey in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago, and he was there at Pepperdine University at the same time that Blasey was studying there. 
So the claim by uh, the unnamed person believed to be Brian Merrick is that a friend of Ford's, Monica McLean, who also went to the private school she attended in suburban Washington, D.C., that uh, she huddled with Blasey Ford before interviews for possible jobs with the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office that might require her to take a polygraph. So the statement from, we believe, Brian Merrick says, quote, I witnessed Dr. Ford help McLean prepare for a potential polygraph exam. Now, McLean says, point blank, I have never had Christine Blasey Ford or anyone else prepare me or provide any other type of assistance whatsoever in connection with any polygraph exam I have taken at any time. Now, I'm going to stop this right here because there, there's more to this back and forth. But the bottom line is that whether Blasey Ford helped McLean prepare for a polygraph test 25 years ago is not at all relevant. Now, maybe she got tripped up on the question because she was thinking about her own polygraph in the recent past and was asked if she had ever assisted someone else. But again, Christine Blasey Ford is not on trial. And you can believe or disbelieve the narrative that she offered last Thursday at the Senate Judiciary Committee. But this idea of trying to undermine her credibility by chipping away at trivial matters, well, this led Grassley to huff and puff and say, this statement raises specific concerns about the reliability of her polygraph examination results. It does? No, it doesn't. And so he wrote a letter to Blasey Ford's lawyers demanding that the Senate see this information. But what are they going to do with it? <laughs> Because they, they've they put this uh, investigation or reinvestigation, the extended background checks, on such a fast track that if, in fact, Blasey Ford's lawyers cough up everything related to the polygraph exam, including audio or video recordings that were taken while it was conducted, so what? This is just pure theater for the media. And then the Republicans are getting into serious slut-shaming with Julie Swetnick. She's the one who said that she witnessed gangbangs, trains as they were called, during high school and that Brett Kavanaugh was present at these incidents where one girl was sexually used by multiple guys. Now, the guy who has come forward to shame her is a former Democratic congressional candidate and a TV weatherman from the Washington, D.C. area, I believe. His name is Dennis Ketterer. And he had a brief relationship. And he specifically states that they never had sex. They had some physical contact. But the juicy comment from Ketterer is he says that Swetnick once told him that she sometimes enjoyed group sex with multiple men and had first engaged in it during high school. Now, this is an attempt to simply call her a slut, say that she wanted it, and if Brett Kavanaugh gave it to her, that, hey, no problem. But Julie Swetnick has made serious allegations that Kavanaugh and Mark Judge spiked the beverages with quaaludes or grain alcohol. Mark Judge's former girlfriend also has issued a sworn statement that he confided in her that he had been involved in these uh, group sex situations and seemed to regret it. And if Julie Swetnick didn't regret it, well, that's her business. It is not yours or mine or Chuck Grassley or any Republican. So the route to bringing Ketterer forward is he now lives in Salt Lake City. He's a member of the, uh, the, the Mormon Church. They don't want us to call, call it that anymore. We're supposed to use the whole name, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, then Ketterer contacted Orrin Hatch, the senator from Utah. And this started last Friday. He was then handed off to staff for Chuck Grassley and the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now to Julie Swetnick. 
Michael Avenatti, her lawyer, went to Twitter yesterday to release a written declaration from a second woman whose statements support Swetnick's claims. She, quote, witnessed firsthand Brett Kavanaugh, together with others, spike the punch at house parties I attended with quaaludes and or grain alcohol. I understood this was being done for the purpose of making girls more likely to engage in sexual acts and less likely to say no. Now, Avenatti said that the FBI has not agreed to meet with Swetnick. He said that if a meeting does take place, she plans to tell the Bureau the names of other people who attended parties in suburban Maryland in the early 1980s. And, of course, uh, that won't go anywhere because we're told the investigation is wrapping up and may be concluded by the end of today, Wednesday. When we know there are many leads that have not been run down. Many people who have begged the FBI to take their testimony who can't get a return phone call. And we finally are getting some clarity on what happens to the FBI's report or reports when they are, uh, I won't say completed, but when they are submitted. They will be submitted to the United States Senate and Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says we will get an FBI report soon. It will be made available to each senator and only senators will be allowed to look at it. He claims that's the way these reports are always handled. But Chuck Schumer, minority leader, says there's a growing consensus that when the FBI's investigation is complete, the findings should be released publicly with any personal information redacted. So this is just a total charade. There is no way that all of these leads, all of these allegations, all of these witnesses can be properly interviewed and have that information assembled in some form that the senators can find useful. This is an exercise in <laughs> in, in just a stagecraft so that the Republicans can say, look, we, we waited a whole week and then we confirmed this guy knowing that he lied bald-faced to us under oath and repeatedly. Their level of denial is simply astounding. And the ranking member, Senator Feinstein from California, said she didn't know if the report should be made public, noting that the FBI likely wouldn't come to any conclusions about what happened. It depends on what is confidential, she said. The committee should have the option to release it. On the other hand, I just don't know what it's going to be because I've never seen a report like this where there's no conclusion. And Trevor Aronson, who has done great work covering and exposing the FBI, he wrote a piece at The Intercept. I've linked to it in the show file for this podcast. And he says, look, these are very simple interviews. Often, under the normal course of action, they only interview people who have been put on a list of references by the person who is seeking a background check for a, an appointment or a security clearance. And Aronson describes how he was surprisingly the subject of a knock on his door and an FBI agent said, hey, one of your neighbors uh, is applying for a security clearance. And Aronson pointed out that if the FBI contacts any of these people in any way related to Kavanaugh, those people are not required to talk to them. Now, they could be penalized if they lie to the FBI, but not for declining to speak or just not answering a question. And so an FBI agent knocked on Aronson's door at home. She said she was visiting as part of a routine background check to renew a neighbor's security clearance. Aronson writes, I didn't have to talk to her, but I saw no harm. She asked me if the neighbor, to my knowledge, had any financial problems or exhibited behavior that otherwise concerned me. No, I answered. Do you know him to associate with any terrorists or subversive elements? I laughed. No, definitely not. And that was it. She thanked me, walked to one of the other houses in the neighborhood, no doubt planning to pose the same questions to someone else. And Aronson also notes judicial background checks focus more on professional conduct and relationships rather than a nominee's personal life. As a result... Kavanaugh's judicial background checks would have been even less likely to unearth allegations about him as a high school and college student than the ones he underwent as an executive branch employee. 
So this is an empty exercise. And we have a list here from the Washington Post of who has submitted to an interview. Mark Judge has, but we don't know if he cooperated. We don't know if he answered every question he was asked. Leland Kaiser, the female who was placed by Ford at the party, but she says she believes Ford, but said that she doesn't remember that event. P.J. Smith, he uh, spoke to the FBI, and again, we don't know what he said. Then there's Timothy Gaudet, uh, the July 1st party that shows up on Brett Kavanaugh's calendar was hosted by Gaudet at his parents' house. Chris Garrett, the FBI interviewed him this week. He is Squee, the uh, football star, I think he is a sports star, I think it was football, uh, who gets a lot of mentions on Kavanaugh's calendars. But Christine Blasey Ford says that uh, she has not been re-interviewed following uh, the testimony and then the uh, <laughs> angry rebuttal by Mr. Kavanaugh on Thursday afternoon last week. Ford's husband has not been contacted by the FBI. Uh, now, here we have a, a, a little conflict because they're saying that Ford's ex-boyfriend, who I named a little bit earlier, and Monica McLean have not been contacted. Uh, but we know that the ex-boyfriend has managed to submit uh, a statement that is being used by the Republicans. Uh, also, uh, uh, Deborah, uh, Debbie Ramirez uh, apparently has been interviewed by the FBI, but a number of his classmates from Yale are still waiting to be interviewed. Uh, and Carrie Burcham is a significant one of those. She contacted the FBI to talk about the text messages that were going back and forth just after Kavanaugh's nomination was announced, but before anybody had heard about Debbie Ramirez or her claims. And that is a significant issue because Kavanaugh said that he didn't make any such contacts, and there's evidence that he lied about that. So uh, <laughs> this is a mess. It, it truly is. And uh, I, at this point, I have to expect that the Republicans are just going to steamroll this whole thing through as they have intended to from the get-go. And it appears the Democrats are out of delay tactics or anything else that could change the trajectory here. There are hundreds of U.S. law professors who are urging the Senate to reject Kavanaugh's confirmation. In their letters, they say he displayed contempt toward members of Congress, showed a political bias that could call into question his future rulings, and they say his temperament is unsuited to a lifetime position on the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, we know those are going to be very persuasive to the Republicans who <laughs> don't want to hear anything that can change their minds about foisting this guy on the U.S. Supreme Court. The other case of uh, an accusation that we're watching closely is the case of Keith Ellison. He's currently the only Muslim congressman. He represents a district near uh, Minneapolis, and he is leaving Congress to run for attorney general of Minnesota, and, as you know, he's been accused by a former girlfriend named uh, Monahan, Karen Monahan, that uh, he psychologically abused her and that there was this one scene where Ellison attempted to drag her off of bed while telling her to get the hell out of his place and that this occurred in 2016. Now, Monahan has repeatedly said she has video of the evidence of this incident, but she has not produced it. And this has led uh, one investigation, which was run by the Democratic Party of Minnesota and led by an attorney named Susan Ellingstad. They have written a report saying, well, we cannot uh, corroborate these charges because the accuser has not supplied the video that she says exists. Now, uh, I don't know if there are other ways to establish her claims, but uh, to the extent that there has been at least some inquiry here, I wouldn't call a political party's investigation dispositive, but it is uh, a first step. 
Now Ellison has asked for local law enforcement to investigate. He also has asked the Ethics Committee of the House of Representatives to investigate, and he continues to deny the claims quite stoutly. Every day, I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Great people like、uh, Kevin Beckley, Jerry from South Portland. Did I get that right, Jerry?、Uh, Siri Walgren and the. Ongoing and very generous Margaret Anderson. She has been supporting my podcast every year,、uh, putting in much more money than she is required, and、uh, I really appreciate you, Margaret Anderson. So, if、uh, you never hear your name called here, it could be because you're not a subscriber, and you can fix that in minutes. In fact, pause this podcast after I give you the instructions. Go to peterbcollins.com. Click menu. Click become a subscriber. You're on the sign-up page. You choose five, ten, twenty dollars a month, the fifty-dollar annual subscription with our bonus CD from John Dist, and you can set those up with PayPal. Or if you would prefer, you can just write me a letter, include a check, money order, cash, but no coins, please. My address is box one fifty six sixty. San Rafael, California, nine four nine one five. Yesterday, I cited an op-ed by Bill McKibben, and he pointed out that while we've been distracted by Kavanaugh Gate, that the Trump dismantling of environmental regulations has not paused, and the torturous treatment of migrant children has not been paused either, and. McKibben made a reference in his Guardian op-ed to a prison camp in Texas, in the town of Tornillo. The camp has been expanded exponentially in the last few months, and I, I noted that McKibben's op-ed appeared in the Guardian. That is a British newspaper, and I often criticize the Guardian for its coverage of Scripple, of Russia, of the Middle East, but. They're scrappy and、uh, resourceful when it comes to covering American stories, and they hired a small plane and flew over the government camp there at Tornillo, and with comparative photos, you know the kind we use to judge the crowd size at Trump's inauguration. Well, they show that it's clear the camp has expanded exponentially from when it was opened in June. And they said then that it would only operate for a few weeks, which turned into three months. And now they say it'll be open at least through the end of the year. And it was、uh, set up to,、uh, let's see, there are a total of twenty four hundred beds now, and it could be expanded by an additional fourteen hundred、uh, if conditions indicate. So this is a concentration camp. This is similar to the Japanese American internment camps that were established in World War II, and because it is primarily children who are being held here, this is an obscenity, and the world knows it. Meanwhile, the Inspector General of the Homeland Security Department has issued a blistering report about the zero tolerance policy that led to the family separation of at least 2,600 children from their parents. And it's blistering. Quote: DHS was not fully prepared to implement the administration's zero tolerance policy or to deal with its after effects. The main departments involved with family separation, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services didn't have adequate information sharing systems. The inspector said it could find no evidence to support a statement made by the two departments in June that there was a central database with information on separated families. That means they lied. Parents were given inconsistent information. Some didn't understand their children would be separated from them. One parent said a border patrol agent told him he'd be reunited with his five-year-old daughter after appearing in court. But when he got there, he was given a flyer explaining he was separated from his child. Border patrol does not provide pre-verbal children—that's、uh, you know toddlers—with wrist bracelets or other means of identification. Nor does Border Patrol fingerprint or photograph most children during processing to ensure that they can be easily linked with the proper file. Yeah, <laughs> you know,、uh, we keep better records of、uh, our dry cleaning than our government did of these human beings. So, <laughs> this is America today. This is the new normal, and I, for one. Really, really protest.
Well, Bernie Sanders deserves a big victory lap. He took on Amazon and Jeff Bezos, and he won. Now, consider back in 2016, when Sanders was hammered by the realists of the Clinton campaign because he advocated for a national $15 minimum wage. And Hillary Clinton said, you know, 12, let, let, let's go for 12, because, you know, you just can't do it nationwide. And yesterday, Amazon announced that every employee across the country, including those at Whole Paycheck, will earn at least $15 an hour. And this was the result of a bill that didn't have any prayer of passing that was co-authored by Sanders and Congressman Ro Khanna of Silicon Valley. It was called the Bezos Act. Stop bad employers by zeroing out subsidies. And they pointed out that Amazon workers rely on food stamps and on other government subsidies to make a living because they don't get paid enough by their employer. So Amazon did change, and uh, this really goes to, I, I think, uh, a great credit to Bernie Sanders. And so today, Sanders is not resting on those laurels. He's introduced another bill that's expected to go nowhere, legislation that would bar financial institutions from holding assets, derivatives, and other forms of borrowing worth more than 3% of the entire U.S. economy. This is to put the brakes on Wall Street excess that melted down the economy 10 years ago. The legislation would force federal regulators to break up J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, as well as insurance giants like Prudential and MetLife. And this is all achieved in a bill that is only seven pages long. <laughs> oh, Bernie, I, I, I really appreciate the work that he does on matters like this. I have my criticisms of Mr. Sanders on foreign policy and on some of the issues he ignores. But in this case, I give him a lot of credit, and I hope to see momentum toward constraining the banks, if not ultimately breaking them up. And there is a new report based on a lengthy investigation of the Trump empire and the family fortune by the New York Times. And uh, apparently they spent 18 months working on this. They published a book-length article about it, and I've uh, absorbed some of the details for you here. But what we learn are critical issues that the Trump fortune, he claims his daddy loaned him a million dollars to get him started and then he had to pay back with interest. Well, we know that he got the equivalent of over $400 million over the years from daddy's real estate empire. By the age of two, he was making an annual income from his father's companies of about $200,000, and he was a millionaire by the age of eight. The other main accusations are that the Trump family uh, badly abused the tax system in shifting assets to prevent them from being taxed in the estate of their father, Fred Trump. Now, I have to say that I'm aware of many wealthy families that use all kinds of trusts and other tax uh, avoidance vehicles that are largely legal. But the Times outline, outlines a number of scams and schemes that appear to be fraudulent, that appear to clearly violate the law, that uh, skated taxation on many, many transactions – including the creation of a shell company called All County Building Supply and Maintenance. And on paper, it was Fred Trump's purchasing agent, buying everything for the apartment buildings and other buildings that he owned. But the Times says that it was a vehicle to siphon cash from the, uh, the, the income of the Fred Trump properties. It also had the effect of raising costs so that they could use, that they could pass through under New York uh, rent control laws, uh, higher rental rates on their unsuspecting tenants. So there is more in the New York Times report, but fundamentally it doesn't really change what we know about Trump. He has bragged about how little he pays in taxes, and he has gotten away with it. He's been audited many times. We don't know uh, to what extent he was penalized by the government. 
But one of the other curious stories is that when Donald was in trouble with one of his Atlantic City casinos, Daddy sent one of his、uh, accountants over to the casino with a big check and purchased three and a half million dollars worth of gambling chips. That got Trump through a critical period where he had to pay off some lenders, and then he paid a fine of almost a hundred thousand dollars for that illegal transaction. So there was a big initial test of the presidential alert system to cell phones all over the country today, at 2:18 Eastern time. The signal went out, and I was here with、uh, half a dozen people at the secret studio at that time. Three of them got the alert, and、uh, the rest of us did not.、Uh, I don't feel bad for being left out, and I do suspect that Trump inst- inst- instigated this because he's jealous of Kim Jong Il. Kim Jong Un, who still has an antiquated public address system with speakers that are installed in、uh, apartment building hallways and elevators in the units of the apartments, and、uh, basically, when the speaker starts to spew stuff, people have to listen. <laughs> and I don't know how often Kim uses that to talk to his peeps, but it is a system that's still in effect in North Korea. The big Facebook breach that、uh, compromised 50 million accounts last week. Apparently, it was based on, or the the vulnerability that's been exposed relates to automated login credentials. So, if you're a Facebook user, you go to Spotify, you go somewhere else, and they say you want to log in with your email, or do you want to log in using Facebook? And what this does is it allows you to avoid putting your password in every time you activate that other media platform or other website. But these tokens, which are a unique string of letters and numbers,、uh, have apparently been hacked or copied. And、uh, so, if you use that kind of、uh, of access where you log in to another site using Facebook, you might consider、uh, changing your process there. The other thing is, is when they ask you for second factor、uh, identification, you know, like your cell phone number, please don't don't give it to them. <laughs> They've already abused that. Vladimir Putin broke some of his silence about the former double agent Sergei Skripal, the alleged victim of the alleged Novichok poisoning in Salisbury this past March, and、uh, in in a forum in Moscow, he said. That Sergei Skripal is a scumbag and a traitor, but he denies ordering the Kremlin to poison the former Russian spy. And finally, today I want to recommend great coverage from Kevin Gostola, one of the bright young journalists in America today. At his site, Shadowproof, he provides detailed coverage of the trial of former Chicago cop Jason Van Dyke. It is not in dispute because of the video evidence that Jason Van Dyke pumped 16 bullets into Laquan McDonald as McDonald was moving away from Officer Van Dyke on that fateful night on Pulaski Avenue in Chicago, and I encourage you to read the report because Jason Van Dyke continues to maintain that despite the obvious video evidence that Laquan McDonald made, made a move toward him, that he felt threatened, that McDonald had a knife. And that he kept pumping bullets into the 16-year-old boy, even after he was on the ground, with the false claim that he was afraid he was going to use the knife on him. The only question is, how long will Jason Van Dyke spend in prison? Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. We'll get it posted as soon as the internet allows. Here, you'll find it on YouTube, and I'm still Peter B. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again. Happy trails.